Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to our very last virtual Cafe Sci of 2020. Can you guys believe how fast this year has gone by? I mean, from March to October, I feel like it's gone by in the blink of an eye. My name is Colin Summerhauser. As many of you may know, I'm the head of Hana House in Palo Alto. And over the course of the past seven months, we have converted all of our in-person events into virtual experiences. And Cafe Sci turned out to be one of our most successful virtual programs this year, thanks to you guys. We've actually engaged more than 2,000 people around the world that we would have not been able to do otherwise had we not gone virtual. And although this is our last virtual Cafe Sci this year, don't worry, we will be back in 2021 with a full lineup of amazing speakers. But in the meantime, I did just want to encourage all of you to expand your horizons and explore our other virtual events hosted by Hana House as well. You can head over to hanahouse.com slash events to find more information and the registration details. So remember, tonight, use the interactive question widget on the bottom of your screen to ask questions throughout the presentation and be sure to upvote the questions you would like to see answered. And with that, I'll hand it over to our Cafe Sci lead, Kay, to introduce our fantastic speaker tonight. Welcome to you all from Cafe Scientific Silicon Valley. Sorry to say it is our last talk of the year 2020. After the holiday hiatus, we'll meet again in January 2021. But today, I'm so happy to introduce our speaker, Dr. Miki Sodi. She is a commercial innovation program manager at the International Space Station, US National Laboratory. Combining her multidisciplinary background and passion for space-based research, she advocates for utilizing the space environment to advance science and technology development for the benefit of life on Earth. Prior to joining the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space, she spent several years as a scientist at a clinical research organization, helping pharmaceutical companies run clinical trials for FDA approval. Now her portfolio spans a wide range of research areas, including aerospace, remote sensing, agriculture, plant biology, and synthetic biology. Born in Tokyo, Japan, Miki calls San Francisco Bay Area her home. She received a BA in physics with an astrophysics minor from University of California, Berkeley, an MS in aerospace engineering from San Jose State University and a PhD in bioengineering through a joint program from the University of California, Berkeley and UC San Francisco. Here is Dr. Sodi. Hi. Hi, my name is Miki Sode. Thank you so much for um, having me uh, to come to Cafe uh, Sai. Thank you, um, Kay and Colin and Luan and Dan for all the support. Um, and I'm happy to present um, some exciting opportunities available at National Lab up in um, International Space Station to benefit life on Earth. So a uh, quick a uh, rundown on today's agenda. Uh, we will start off by talking about what is ISS National Lab um, and why do we bring experience, uh, experiments to space and, and we're gonna look at the portfolio to see who is sending experiments to space and what they're doing over there. And um, also uh, important topic about community that we built. Um, and uh, at the end, uh, we will open up the floor to questions and um, learn more about ISS. So let's get started. Uh, probably not many people on this call um, may not know that there is a space, uh, there is a, a national lab up in space. Um, it's, so maybe we could start off with the history of the ISS. So ISS took about 10 years and more than 30 missions to assemble. It is the result of unprecedented scientific and engineering collaboration and among five space agencies representing 15 countries. So the first unit actually was launched in 1998. Uh, it was called a Unity, and it was the first U.S. built components of the ISS. Um, and it was the uh, 
a space, first space shuttle mission dedicated for this purpose. Um, by 2000, uh, year 2000, actually November 2nd, so the anniversary is coming up, but the astronaut uh, Bill Shepard and cosmonaut Yuri Gidzenko and Sergei Kik Kikalev uh, was the first crew to reside on board the station, staying several months. So this year we are actually celebrating 20 years of continuous human presence in space on board the ISS. So imagine the college sophomore now, 20 years old, have never uh, lived in the world that there was no human living outside of, uh, of the earth, which is, um, I think it's quite an uh, achievement that the uh, human being have uh, reached. Some fun facts about ISS. The International Space Station is approximately the size of a football field. Um, and the interior is about the size of a five bedroom house. Um, and it weighs about 460 ton, but it's in microgravity environment, so the weight doesn't matter. Um, it, it is traveling at the speed of uh, 17,500 miles per hour. Uh, it orbits around Earth every 90 minutes at an altitude of about 20, uh, 250 miles. So that means um, within a day, you get 16 sunrises and sunsets. That's um, kind of crazy world. Um, okay, so by 2005, uh, Congress designated the US portion of the ISS as the nation's national lab to maximize its use by non-NASA US government agencies, academic institutions, and private sector um, uh, in order to leverage unique environment and facility on board the um, ISS to advance science, technology development, and education for improving quality of life on Earth and promote a collaboration. So there are actually 17 national labs, but they are all uh, Department of Energy national labs. So ISS National Lab is the only non DOE National Lab, and it's only NASA uh, National Lab. And uh, the, this is important because like other national labs, um, the facility is important for science discovery and technology advancement, but it's too big for one institution to manage. Um, but still have a significant meaning to the science community. So that's why it is designated as a um, national lab. And it just so happened that the ISS uh, is uh, floating in, in the sky 250 miles up. So, uh, but the, the essence of the reason why it's a national lab is, is still true as the other um, Department of Energy national labs. So, um, so the ISS National Lab is managed by the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space, or in short cases, which is the legal name of my um, organization. And, uh, and it was designated so with the agreement with NASA um, in 2011. Okay. So our mission is to foster scientific discovery and technology innovation in space and to expand the US leadership in innovation in commercial space sector, and to inspire the next generation through ISS STEM education opportunity. Uh, how do we accomplish our missions? We uh, work both on the demand creation as well as enforcing the supply side to meet the demand. Um, so we maximize utilization of the International Space Station by pursuing groundbreaking science, technology, and innovation not possible here on Earth across a diverse range of fields, including fundamental and translational research in the life science, physical science, remote sensing, technology development, and education. We also create new partnership across disciplines with commercial companies, entrepreneurs, and startups, and academic and governmental institutions. Um, and we also draw on the result of ISS National Lab Science to improve the lives of people here on Earth and provi provide value to the nation. Um, so those, these three points are uh, on the demand side and, and communicating that, that there is a, uh, a value to ex conducting experiments in space. 
On the uh, supply side, we work together very closely with NASA, uh, service providers and implementation partners to provide diverse hardware and facilities to support a range of research activities. So why do you do experiments in space? Basically, research in space provides a paradigm shift. It reveals features of terrestrial life and physical processes that cannot be seen or manipulated on Earth. And um, it, it comes down to actually three big things. So space and the ISS provide a platform to study more about microgravity environment, extreme condition and vantage point. And then we're gonna go uh, over each one of them. So the first one is a microgravity. Uh, or weightlessness, it alters many observable phenomena with the, within the physical and life sciences. For example, systems and processes affected by microgravity include surface wetting uh, and inter, uh, interfacial tension, uh, multi-phase flow and heat transfer, multi-phase system dynamics, solidification, and fire and combustion. Moreover, microgravity induces a vast array of changes in organisms ranging from viruses and bacteria to humans, including global alteration in gene expression and three-dimensional aggregation of cells into tissue-like architecture. The second one is the extreme conditions. The ISS provides access to extreme conditions right outside and it includes exposure to extreme heat and cold cycling from minus 200 degrees Celsius to positive 2,200 degrees Celsius within 90 minutes, auto vacuum, atomic oxygen, and high energy radiation. So testing and qualification of materials or so sensors and component subsystems exposed simultaneously to those extreme conditions have provide, provided data and it enables the manufacturing of long life reliable components used on Earth as well as in the, um, the, in the satellites and spacecraft components. The third one is uh, the vantage point. So the ISS offers a unique vantage point uh, based on its location within low Earth orbit. So as I was uh, saying earlier, the ISS offers a unique um, it is at the altitude of 250 miles, and its orbit, opening path covers more than 85% of Earth's surface and about 95% of the world populated areas. So observations from this orbital platform can provide variable lighting conditions and a wide range of Earth viewing resolutions and viewing geometries compared to the say sun synchronous orbits of typical Earth remote sensing satellites. Um, and that allows insight into diversity of, um, and, and ranging, uh, ranging from atmospheric modeling to agriculture to storm tracking. So the ISS is indeed a um, state of the art orbiting laboratory, right? And it has a hardware and facility um, providing a wide variety of equipment and systems for enabling advanced R&D and technology demonstrations. So for example, we have freezers, um, uh, uh, like minus 80 freezers or furnaces, exterior testing platforms, centrifuge, fluid uh, integration labs, microscope, of course, cell culture incubator, glue box, DNA sequencer, uh, rodent research habitat and dissection capability, 3D printer and 3D bioprinter, and many other uh, labs and capability. And uh, we actually have a very thick book of uh, all the facilities up on ISS um, and available through NASA uh, uh, website. So the ISS National Lab works with investigators to identify the best technologies for each specific investigation and also works with our network, network of experienced service providers who could help integrate your research for maximum success, right? And, um, but we shouldn't forget that the ISS is a crude 
um, vehicle or uh, orbiting lab. There are there are men and women there now to carry out your research. Many astronauts nowadays are actually trained scientists from microbiologists to plant scientists so that they have a deeper understanding of what's important for your science and, and ready to conduct your research uh, on, on the ISS. So why do we do all of this? Um, our goal is to enable space research that leverages these unique conditions so that its result can be used to improve our lives here on Earth. Ultimately, ISS National Lab strives to bring value and impact back to the US economy and taxpayers by benefiting life here on Earth from new drug development to new hyperspectral sensors to monitor environmental changes on Earth or to maybe new optical fiber materials with superior quality. The ISS National Lab essentially enables science in space to benefit life on Earth. So let's take a look at the um, ISS National Lab portfolio. You will see projects in wide range of disciplines such as life sciences, physical sciences, remote sensing, technology development with partners you may heard of, but don't necessarily associate with space. Most recently, Northrop Grumman had a, a 14th commercial resupply service mission to the ISS uh, that was launched in, on October 3rd. Um, that was last week, it, uh, yeah, um, or 10 days ago, so, okay along with thousands of pounds of supplies to the orbital lab, this mission carried more than 20 payloads supposed, uh, uh, sponsored by the ISS US National Lab, all aimed at leveraging the unique environment of space station to further um, establish a sustainable market in low earth orbit and advanced science, scientific knowledge that will bring value to our nation. So um, I'm gonna start a three minute video, um, uh, which is an overview of what was on this NG-14 flight. More than 20 payloads sponsored by the International Space Station U.S. National Laboratory are planned for launch on Northrop Grumman's 14th Cargo Resupply Services mission to the orbiting laboratory. This launch will send a variety of research and technology development investigations that will further enable a market in low Earth orbit while also driving scientific knowledge that brings value to our nation. Here are some of the featured payloads ready to take flight on this mission. Not only is Northrop Grumman the launch service provider for this mission, but they're also sending a payload of its own as a technology prototype demonstration. SharkSat is a small payload that will mount to the Cygnus spacecraft with a mission to collect telemetry data demonstrating the feasibility of new sensors and processing new technologies in low Earth orbit. Maiden Space will be launching a ceramic manufacturing facility that will leverage microgravity to produce turbine components with improved performance for use in the aerospace industry. This is the latest step by the company to expand its in-space manufacturing capabilities for consumers on Earth. Felix and Paul Studios will be launching a 360 degree camera designed to accompany astronauts outside of the space station for the first time ever to film a spacewalk in cinematic virtual reality. This will be part of an upcoming virtual reality series intended to engage and educate the general public on living and working aboard our orbiting laboratory. Multiple life science investigations on this mission aim to use the space-based environment to develop more effective therapeutics and improve patient care on Earth. One of these investigations from GlaxoSmithKline, a worldwide leader in drug development, will evaluate how microgravity affects two liquid solutions commonly used in the development of therapeutics. Results could help the company create safer and longer lasting products for patients on Earth. Another investigation from innovative startup Kernel Biologics will test candidate messenger RNA molecules in the absence of gravity to identify which molecules are best able to aid in the identification of cancerous human cells among healthy ones. These results may help in the development of new medications to treat leukemia. 
The National Science Foundation continues to provide millions of dollars in support of research on the space station to advance fundamental knowledge in both the physical and life sciences. One of these projects will observe spherical flames in space to increase understanding of the physics of cool diffusion flames, which burn at temperatures below 400 degrees Celsius. Results could have implications on combustion engine efficiency and help reduce emissions on Earth. The second project will study the motion of liquid drops on the ISS to better understand inertial spreading, which could have applications in medicine, agriculture, and other industrial processes. These payloads represent only a tiny snapshot on the full breadth of research flying on this mission. To get a deeper dive into all the science sponsored by the National Lab launching on Northrop Grumman CRS-14, please visit our mission overview page at issnationallab.org. Okay, I hope you enjoyed those, um, that uh, video. We have more videos for um, on our YouTube channel, um, and we have a short clip like that uh, for every mission um, that we uh, sent the payload into. So please check it out. Okay, so let's look at the uh, our portfolio by the numbers. And uh, so this is actually a fiscal year 19 data because we just finished fiscal year 20. So we we're just gathering the data, but I think it gives you a pretty good uh, idea of our portfolio. Um, so on the left bar chart, we you could it's uh, you could see that we have um, increased our payload every year, and we have a pretty good represent representation of commercial, government, academic, and nonprofit um, entities. Um, and 64% of uh, new projects are from new to space investigators, and uh, some of the examples I think we uh, saw it in the the video was um, uh, Greek, uh, Graxos Miss Klein, uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, those are the um, pharmaceutical companies, as well as um, the Adidas, uh, the shoe company. Um, we also have uh, some returning customers like uh, National Cancer Institute and Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Uh, they are seeking to build on past R&D success on board the ISS National Lab. A large percent of our uh, projects in fiscal year 19 were associated with rodent research reference missions. As you can see that the life sciences is taking over probably uh, like a good two third of our portfolio in, in fiscal year 19. But if you take a look at the inner circle, this is the um, uh, five, six year um, process. It's still the life science is uh, about the half of our portfolio. Um, so yeah, so this, this this life science is a big area for us, and um, especially in 2019, fiscal year 2019, we had this um, uh, nine, uh, 21 new rodent research project awarded as a part of the research solicitation that we have to support rodent research reference missions. So these missions were uh, to maximize science return from traditionally constrained resources, allowing tissue sharing and um, among other multiple research laboratories. So, um, and these are good for studying bone loss, muscle wasting, heart diseases, uh, immune dysfunction and other conditions using this model organism. And, um, and overall 74% of new project are uh, in life science and advanced materials and manufacturing. So that's kind of the uh, landscape of our portfolio. So how can you be a part of the, uh, how can you send your experiments up to the International Space Station? So while we are not a granting agency, we often have solicitation with sponsors who stepped up to support innovative research to solve big cross-cutting problems in space. So most notably, we have um, multiple solicita solic solicitations with other governmental agencies for years. For example, um, in 2018, we had a solicitation on human physiology research in partnership with National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, NCATS, and National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering. 
Um, both are a part of the National Institute of Health. This solicitation uh, featured tissue on chips or uh, organ on chips technology, which is to help scientists develop and advance novel technologies to improve human health. The, uh, we also had a solicitation with National Science Foundation for tissue engineering and mechanobiology, as well as uh, on transport phenomena research. So similar to NIH tissue chip solicitation, but this time it was in partnership National Science Foundation. And this solicitation was seeking for project in general field of tissue engineering and mechanobiology. Um, the other one was in partnership with the Division of Chemical Bioengineering and Environmental Transport. Uh, within NSF and it was um, uh, also done in 2018. And it was for the general field of transport phenomena on the ISS as many processes that affect the behavior of fluid on earth, such as convection, sedimentation, hydrostatic pressure and buoyancy are absent in microgravity environment and which provides an opportunity um, for to, to study fluid dynamics, multi-phase um, processes or thermal transport and combustion and fire systems. Other types of um, research opportunities and partnership uh, is with the accelerators. So one good example is this partnership uh, we have with Mass Challenge. Mass Challenge is a global startup accelerator based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So our partners, um, our um, partnership um, is aimed to expose their network of entrepreneurs and partners to the possibilities and advantages of space-based research and technology development um, on the ISS. So we actually uh, have this since 2013 and uh, uh, also partnering with Boeing. And uh, we jointly offered the Boston cohort a new opportunity to compete for about $500,000. Uh, it's called Technology in Space Award. And this competition is held in parallel with the overall Mass Challenge program. And to date, we have provided about $4.5 million in funding to 26 seed stage companies. And um, they uh, claim that the program has helped accelerate commercialization for several of these startups. Another partnership that we have is uh, corporations. For example, in 2017, we partnered up with Target Corporations, the maker, well, it is, this is the target that you go get milk or t-shirts or school supplies. We partner up with them to uh, solicit ISS research project concept to leverage the ISS um, and its capability to improve sustainable cotton production on earth because uh, Target sell, sells cotton t-shirts, but it, it, cotton, cotton is a very thirsty crop and it requires lots of water. So as a part of corporate social responsibility, Target wanted to advance um, research towards sustainable cotton production. So that's, that was the solicitation we had. Uh, we sometimes have a, a solic solicitation to utilize um, capability on board the ISS. So um, earlier this year, we actually had a solicitation for utilizing the material um, International Space Station experiment or MISI platform. It's a, a, a facility attached on uh, exterior of the ISS um, operated by Alpha Space. Um, and um, this experiment uh, could be in the field of material science or device testing or other researches and development areas that require uh, MISTI platform, the external exposure platform. So unfortunately, we, we, we don't have um, an open research opportunity at the moment, but please visit our website or sign up to our newsletter to get more um, information or uh, notification for the upcoming opportunities. Uh, we also accept um, unsolicited proposal all year long. So whether it's solicited or unsolicited, the, uh, 
process of submitting your proposal is generally the same. It takes uh, two steps. The first step is a uh, very high level two page concept summary. Um, it should talk about the uh, objective and hy hypothesis to test, concept of operation just at high level. Uh, but most importantly, we are looking to hear um, and um, about why it has to be done on the ISS or how the result will advance scientific knowledge or commercial potential and how it will be benefit life here on earth. After um, operational feasibility, compliance and science and ec economic review, you may be then invited to proceed to the next step, which is a full proposal, which basically um, expound on the, the, the concept summary, the two page into 10 pages. But at this stage, you get to work with implementation partners um, and further develop your concept of operation. Um, and in full proposal, you expand uh, further on key points such as the reason for uh, conducting this experiment in space and again, benefit life on earth. And uh, one thing that uh, to note here is that our process is highly interactive and iterative. So we are here to guide you through the process. So as I mentioned earlier, in order to achieve our mission of enabling science in space to benefit life on earth, we work on creating demand and enforcing supply to meet that demand. Um, essentially, that cannot be made possible without a strong community of organizations, agencies, individuals, and a dynamic and growing community of uh, in orbit commercial facility operators. Uh, uh, that the ISS National Lab works together with. So space is so hard and it is, um, it takes a whole village to send an experiment to the ISS. Um, so the ISS National Lab continues to engage with new customers, particularly from the private sector, say from Fortune 500 companies to promising startups across uh, all of our research verticals, the life science, physical sciences, remote sensing and technology development. As a uh, part of such effort, we host our annual flagship conference called ISS R&D Conference in partnership with NASA and American Astronautical Society. So this year conference was held virtually due to COVID of course, um, but it spread out through August to October. Um, so in fact, actually, you can still catch the day three of the conference next Thursday. Um, so please visit issconference.org to register. And traditionally, the last day, the day three of our conference, uh, we focus on the impact and success of educational programs um, that enable students to conduct research on the orbiting lab. We also host a number of workshops and seminars for specific topics throughout uh, the year. For example, as a part of ISS R&D conference this year, we had tissue engineering and regenerative medicine in space seminar series. We also had additive manufacturing in space workshop as well. Uh, the recordings of those workshops and reports are um, of the highlights are available on our website. So I'll uh, strongly encourage you to check it out if you're interested in these topics. Um, and we also have many in-house scientists and business development team members uh, often appear and get on a stage at conferences of a diverse range of discipline from bio to World Stem Cell Summit to Material Research Society meetings. So these Outreach activities has accelerated demand for the ISS National Lab with the industry, academia, and non-NASA government agencies, um, both from potential users and from organization interested in participating in ISS National Lab. So by bringing new and existing users to our partners, such as NASA, service providers, and implementation partners, um, it encourages and enforces collaborative and supportive community. So last but 
uh, certainly not least, I wanted to talk a little bit about our STEM education program. There are dozens of programs within Space Station Explorer Consortium, which is the consortium that um, our organization uh, is managing. Um, and they are all geared towards education, uh, educating students and inspiring the next generation of space researchers and explorers. So one highlight here is uh, something called Toma to Tomato Sphere. It's um, an award winning curriculum driven free program that uses an excitement of space exploration and technology um, to teach the skills and processes of scientific experimentation. Um, and uh, so the first, the Seed Foundation and the ISS National Lab work together to send tomato seeds to the ISS and bring them back to Earth and uh, for classroom to use. So more than 3.3 uh, million students have participated since Tomato Sphere have launched in 2001. So that's a quite a big reach that we have. Um, again, tune in to ISS R&D conference day three next Thursday to learn more. Okay, so I hope you learned that there is a great potential in thinking creatively and taking advantage of the unique environment and facility and accessibility to space provided by ISS National Lab and its partner for furthering your science and developing innovative technology, um, ultimately to benefit life here on earth. Whether you are an academic researcher, an entrepreneur, an investor, or an engineer, or teacher, or a student, we are here to have a conversation with you. And it is our job to find the most impactful ways to directly um, direct our program and activities to work with you to um, so that we can bring benefit of space-based research for the betterment of life here on earth and for the future. So I would welcome uh, questions and ideas from you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mickey. Um, I, we have a ton of questions coming in already. So I'll just maybe start from the top and uh, go down the list and feel free guys, uh, audience, if you guys have more questions, feel free to throw them in the chat and I'll be sure to get to them. So uh, first question that came in, I know the video did touch on it slightly, but maybe you could talk a little bit more about it. It says, is there any health related research ongoing in space that could benefit fighting or preventing pandemics? Ooh, um, so not yet or not now. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, it takes, um, we actually thought about this. Um, Nothing that would directly touch on the COVID um, or, or coronavirus, right? Well, first of all, it's been about six, seven months into this. Um, and so it, it takes a long time to manifest a project. And especially if um, contagious and dangerous such as coronavirus, we really have to make sure that it's contained correctly and it has um, safety regulation and stuff. So actually sending the virus itself is very hard. Um, so that's one. Um, but there are many life science experiments related to, uh, maybe indirectly related to the um, therapeutics, like drug therapeutics. And so I don't know how that might manifest. I haven't thought deeply about that yet, um, but uh, the pharmaceutical companies are constantly doing experiments um, from you know drug discovery to uh, formulation of uh, drugs so that it will be delivered more easily or more available to um, the people here. Um, so that could, you know, some knowledge that's gained from there could be a part of, may play a little role in the coronavirus or pandemic. So um, yeah, I, I just haven't thought deeply about that yet. No, that's, that's perfect. Thank you for that answer. All right, another question for you is, it says, how is crystallization in zero gravity different? Yes, so because of the lack of gravity, and there's no thermal uh, convection and all, that uh, crystallization of matter 
happens very slowly. And, and, um, and that means that the, the crystal is more homogeneous and have uh, less imperfection. Uh, sometimes it glows bigger, um, and, uh, but the purity is the key. So it, the crystallization is uh, big um, and for, especially for something that molecular level perfection or homogeneity matters a lot. So, uh, so for example, um, the protein crystallization has been used um, in the, this, the drug discovery. Um, and also we have uh, up, uh, uh, exotic optical fiber experiments, which is kind of built upon that um, crystallization. Awesome, awesome. Okay, here's, here's a fun one. Has the lab been damaged by space material? And if so, how do they repair it? Mm, so the, um, actually, so the, when you say lab, actually, it's as if there is a boundary within ISS and like here, here this line and here on is the lab and not. So it's, it doesn't work that way. Actually, we don't have a physical lab per se, um, <laughs> but, um, but, we say labs because we we can use different facility within an ISS. So I will take I, I will rephrase the question to 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 mean that has ISS been threatened by the orbital debris? The answer is yes. We actually have small um, uh, particles hit ISS, but like it's not a. a um, uh, let's say it's not catastrophic. There are researchers um, um, in NASA too, uh, studying the, the impact of small debris um, and um, assessing you know, how big should it be or how fast should it be and then kind of um, monitoring the threat too. So, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Um, here's another good one. It says, what is the life expectancy of the lab? What will happen when it re-enters the atmosphere? Will it just burn up? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, right now, um, we have a guarantee to have ISS up to um, 2024, uh, but the Boeing is the major uh, contractor who put the structure of ISS, right? Um, they said because of the, uh, the materials and the structure integrity standpoint, it should last up to 2030. So there are, I think, uh, Senate bills and, and some discussions to extend the life of ISS to 2028 or 2030. But the you know, result is yet to see. We are still in the big debate about that. Um, so we don't know how the end of life of ISS is happening. We, there are, again, lots of debate about the uh, transitional plan of ISS, I know what should, how should we decommission, or um, we have to think about beyond ISS, like what's gonna happen um, after ISS got decommissioned, would it? Um, and then the consensus is that there would be, hopefully the commercial space station operators launching, you know, new, whether crewed or non-crewed space station. So we may, uh, you know, thoroughly phase uh, and transfer the research and um, technology development activities to the commercial providers. Um, and uh, maybe NASA would become one of the customers at that point. We, we don't know. But those kind of discussion are ongoing uh, in um, space sector and Washington, D.C. as well. Wow. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. Um, OK, I got another good question for you. It says, it seems like the ISS could be modified to allow additional experiments that are teleoperated from Earth. So mm -hmm. minimizing the number of people on the station, but maximizing the science. Has this been considered? Yes, yes, we actually, um, let's see, we, uh, lots of um, experiment, like facilities on board ISS are um, automated as much as possible. 
to minimize the crew interaction, right? Uh, because crew time is the most scarce resource up on the ISS. So more streamlined and automated your experiments are the better. But also we, um, there are many say, um, experimental robots, like um, we have something called spheres or astro bees, or I think GM had a, a, a robonaut um, to, that's sort of um, basically trying to help astronaut do some um, maybe routine task or some tasks that doesn't require too much human interaction. Yeah, so that kind of effort is ongoing. Okay, great. Um... Here's another question. It says, who generally are ISS's government partners or participants? Example, you know, the CDC or the EPA. Uh, based on that graph, there didn't seem to be that many government participants. So uh, this person's curious who actually sees the value. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, I, I, Colleen, you broke up a little bit. So I'm trying to... Um, I can repeat. Can repeat that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I said, who basically are the ISS's government partners or participants? So, you know, for example, the CDC or the EPA, um, there doesn't seem to be many government participants based on that graph. So the person mm -hmm. is curious who actually sees yeah, that. Gotcha. Yeah, so actually, uh, NASA sends lots of experiments to ISS, right? Um, so, but... Uh, ISS National Lab or CASE is my organization. We are focused on non-NASA government, um, non-NASA demand, which include other government agencies like NSF or NIH. Um, we haven't, uh, let's see, our biggest partner is NIH and NSF. And we do work with other national labs too, like um, Oak Ridge, let's say, right? Uh, yeah, so, but I think we, um, we could, we, um, yeah, but they are the biggest custom, government customers, um, but we also focus on engaging with the private sectors as well. That's why um, we had a big representation of uh, commercial users as well as academic users, yeah. Yep, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, here's a funny one. Do rodents learn how to maneuver through their surroundings in zero gravity? What do they do and how do they move? <laughs> yes, um, yeah, they do. Um, I think, I'm not the rodent ex expert, but, but there are certain degree of adaptation too, uh, whether it's rodent or spider or ants. Um, there's been many small animals and insects flow into space, but uh, they seem to be confused a little bit for the first few days, but adapt in a very weird way uh, to microgravity environment, but somehow they um, manage themselves. Like say, for example, rodent have to find food and somehow figure out the way to eat or, or else they die. So they figure out how to live in microgravity environment. Wow, that's that's super interesting. Um, all right, so here's another question. What are some examples of industries that could benefit from satellite imagery that you have either mm -hmm. partnered with in the past or considering partnering with in the future? Yeah, so um, let me see. There are um, a number of sensors on the ISS and um, Lots of uh, sensors are actually looking at the, um, say, uh, let me see. I think one example could be a hyperspectral image is looking at the, uh, say, um, a pollution or CO2 distribution, something like that. So that could be used for, um, uh, say, um, let me actually do it this way. Um, one good example, maybe that's relevant to the time that we're living now, is that we can use uh, ISS sensors as well as, uh, as satellite sensors to look at, say, uh, a fire in, in California, right? So ISS is a part of uh, ISS sensors are part of a um, available satellite imagery 
um, in case there is natural disaster like that. So let's say local government could um, request to get a before and after picture of the disaster hit area so that they could um, strategize what would be the best way to allocate resources or deploy um, first uh, responders or something like that. So that's actually, it's probably one example that I can think of at the moment. No, yeah, that's that definitely makes a lot of sense, especially with the fires going on in California right now. All right, so here's another one. How did uh, the testing or research on the ISS ultimately result in improved sustainability of cotton production? Right. <laughs> so, okay. So let me see. Well, actually, I could go on to the slide, the next um, extra slide that I prepared. <laughs> so let's talk about this cotton sustainability challenge that we had with Target um, corporations. So again, the cotton is a very important part of our daily lives and, and many consumer products um, that we use today from t-shirts to jeans to bed, linens to coffee filters, it, they are all driven or, or derived from cotton, right? So it's estimated that about 25 million tons of cotton are produced around the world each year. And uh, just to produce about 2.2 pounds or like one kilograms of cotton, it requires about like 2,600 to 5,300 gallons of water. So um, again, the this partnership with Target was basically to utilize ISS um, research uh, capability um, and, and to improve sustainable production on Earth. And so what happened was um, Target decided to put down $1 million towards this effort. And we selected three projects. Um, and one is in remote sensing area and the other two are in plant biology. So the, 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 this remote sensing one, it's probably a good answer to the earlier question too, that it was awarded to a company called Upstream Tech. It's a, maybe we can't call it startup anymore, but uh, it's a company um, uh, in, uh, 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 that proposed to incorporate ISS remote sensing imagery into data sets from other Earth observation satellites and sensors, um, and then feed them all into their proprietary machine learning algorithm for farmers uh, to use as an, um, say, evidence-based uh, decision-making tool uh, for better water management and real-time monitoring of the cotton crops, right? So that's the remote sensing one. The, the first of the two plant biology one, one the, this is, uh, was awarded to Christopher Saski of Crimson University. Um, and then his proposal was aimed at uh, better understanding the genes uh, that's responsible for water use efficiency and um, under stressful and changing environment. Um, and he wanted to study three different types of cotton cultivars during growth and regeneration to identify this uh, genes responsible for stress response. The third one, the second of the two plant biology experiments was uh, awarded to Simon Giroy of the University of Wisconsin um, Madison. And this proposal was aiming to examine the root system architecture and its influence on stress resilience, um, and which of course related to water use efficiency and carbon sequestration during um, seeding establishment. So as you can see, we use a, um, we, we do plant experimenting space because space is a very stressful environment. And they often those plant experiments are looking for genes that are responsible for, for stressful environment that could be um, drought or uh, elevated CO2 level or something like that. Wow, that's, yeah, that's fascinating. I did not know there was that much going on with cotton in space. Um, it's actually a good segue. We have a question here that says, are ground-based microgravity analogs and ISS microgravity different? Why should we use the ISS versus ground-based analogs? Yeah, yeah, good question. So we do have a, a ground-based um, analogs. Uh, I think it's 
uh, often, um, well, so there's a drop tower, which gives you maybe, you know, few seconds of microgravity environment or rotating vessels. So basically there, this specimen is within the tumbling um, apparatus, I guess, to constantly falling and not really hitting the wall because it's constantly rotating. Um, so that the drop tower, well, let's start with the, the rotating vessels that you, because of the big setup to create that, um, environment, it's, um, it only fits small specimen, right? So, so small size. The drop tower, or maybe you might think about um, balloons or um, the vomit comet, the comet, right? Like the, the hyperbolic um, flight and everything, or suborbital flights like Blue Origins have. Um, that is a free fall, but that only lasts for, let's say suborbital flight may last maybe 12 minutes or so, maybe 10 minutes, something like that. Um, there are um, things that you can do in that short time, but what ISS gives is the sustained microgravity. So it's, um, let's say in space shuttle era, shuttle missions are only two weeks long, maybe three weeks, but the ISS is floating there 24 seven um, all year long. And so if your experiment requires that sustained microgravity, say for example, you, if you're growing a, a plant and waiting for it to seed and sprout or something like that, that won't happen uh, that fast, right? Um, so, or if you're studying bone loss, then that requires, um, mice to be in microgravity environment for weeks. That could only be done on ISS. Yep, that makes sense. And that's actually funny you bring that up. There is a question that says, is anyone studying what level of artificial gravity is necessary to halt bone loss? Um, so, <laughs> so artificial gravity is a whole another discussion because um, I think the if you look at sci-fi or some studies that done by NASA a long time ago um, about artificial gravity is usually rotation and rotating a big structure and that centripetal force is creating a so-called artificial gravity. But artificial gra that's actually different from actual gravity. So in other words, we don't know how to create gravity and Yes, the centripetal force is a good analog to maybe you know uh, 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 provide loading that's close to what the, the, the gravity gravitational force might impose on the body, but it does have a lot of logistical um, hurdles. Like you have to have a big, big um, structure in order to have a constant load load on your body, because otherwise the load imposed on your um, leg and the head could be different or um, because there's a gradient depending on the distance from the center of the rotation and all of that stuff. So there are lots of theories and I bet um, many researchers are working on um, systems and design and how uh, feasibility and all of that. Unfortunately, I'm not like, you know, up to date on everything about artificial gravity, uh, but um, there are many other ways um, proposed as a countermeasure to bone loss, right? And for the matter of fact, actually, the bone loss is not the only negative physiological effect of uh, lack of gravity. So yes, you know, we do, astronauts do lose bone about three times faster than osteoporotic women, and that's a serious issue. Um, but also there is a cardiovascular uh, conditioning to muscle loss, to fluid shift, to, to um, ocular deformation and all of that. So there are many physiological effects and um, uh, there are researchers um, studying all of those different effects and how uh, understand better so that they can come up with a countermeasures for all those um, negative physiological effects. But uh, I, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, we're coming up on 
our last few questions, last one in here, it says, can you give specific examples of ISS discoveries that have been converted into day-to-day -day usable tools, techniques, or products? Okay, um, so let me see, day-to-day -day product. So because, um, uh, let's see, I have to think um, my portfolio as an ISS National Lab, which in existence for about 10 years, and I'm not like a, a, a walking encyclopedia of all the research that happened on ISS uh, or <laughs> um, by NASA or other agencies. Um, and maybe I might be mixing some studies that done on space shuttle era too. But I also have to say that sometimes uh, depending on the um, maturity of the science or technology development, it sometimes the experiment may have happened earlier uh, in the development phase, but won't see the end product and get in the hands of people until say 10, 15 years later, right? Um, so it's kind of hard to point what would be a good example, but let me see. Um, so maybe I can give you some example that could have a um, direct, um, yeah, um, maybe that partially answer your question. Let me, maybe that's my best um, answer. Okay. so. Say, for example, Eli Lilly uh, and company, which is a big pharmaceutical company, had a, a, uh, a series of experiments on ISS. And one of them, I, um, it's actually one of my favorite, is that uh, it's a uh, wet, hard to wet surface experiments is the title. It's basically studying a, how a solid um, tablet dissolve in, um, in a solution like water. So, which sounds very basic in a way, right? Like say, if you think about alpha seltzer <laughs> and dropped into water, it will bubble up and, and dissolve. And that's how, basically how the medicine work. Um, but if there, and then maybe you've, you've seen a picture of an astronaut floating in a microgravity environment, and then there's a, a, a sphere or ball of water, and then you put in alpha seltzer in there slide in there and then it would start to bubble, but definitely the it, the, it doesn't dissolve as fast as if it was, you know, here on earth drop into the water. So because the, um, if you think about here, uh, well, this is a problem if, let's say if you are an astronaut and you have an important um, task to carry right now, but you have a pounding headache and if the, if the Tylenol or aspirin, this painkiller doesn't work right away because it doesn't dissolve in, in your body, that's a big problem. So um, this Eli Lilly was interested in how this solid tablet dissolve into water. And if you do it in microgravity environment, everything happens um, slowly. So the researchers were able to study how that happens and other force, how the other forces are acting on it so that they could learn from it and then um, uh, and change the formulation of a drug so that it could dissolve much better so that the astronaut with pounding headache could have a um, relief uh, from the pain in reasonable time. And that could also help um, make better drugs here on earth that would you know, help your headache as well. So um, something like that, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, it takes a lot of time usually for the research to become a, a physical product that yeah, that's like a lot of stuff. Um, so here's a couple last ones. What is there any sort of military research being conducted on ISS National Lab? Uh, so military. So we, ISS National Lab, we don't have that. But um, that doesn't ex that doesn't mean the whole portfolio of uh, NASA, but I just don't know that. I just okay. 
No, no worries. Um, all right. And then here's a good one to end on. It says, are there any positive effects of microgravity on biological systems? Uh, yes. So um, there are a couple, say for example, um, the, it kind of dovetails the early discussion about the organ on chip or um, um, studying drugs in space station. Like we have um, experiments um, on organoid. So organoid is a, like a little blurb of cells that you could study uh, or you can make and see the interventions like drugs or um, some stimuli could affect that tissue, right? So, um, and so that is the tissue on chip or organoid um, experiments are used heavily by pharmaceutical company or NIH, uh, those researchers who are interested in um, modeling the effect of interventions in uh, tissues um, so that they can make better drugs or um, or other interventions, right? So that's uh, one way. Another thing that we are looking at is uh, stem cell research as well. So in microgravity environment, stem cells um, proliferate more, but doesn't difference, differentiate as, as much. So in other words, we could study longer about the stem cell behavior and, um, and, uh, and that's an active area of study. Um, another example is that uh, in microgravity environment, um, our immune system function goes down, but, but the virality of the um, bacteria and viruses goes up. So um, the immune response is uh, another big um, topic that being studied from space shuttle era to early ISS to, to now too, like how would um, that gives pharmaceutical industry and researchers the idea to um, immune response um, and maybe come up with a drug for it too. Interesting. All right. I think it's time to wrap up here now. So I think, thank you guys for tuning in to virtual cafe side this evening. And thank you so much, Mickey, for taking the time to speak with us tonight about the ISS national lab. I know for me personally, this topic was extremely interesting, especially as it pertains to life on earth. Um, I know based on our chat, our attendees found it very fascinating as well. Um, for the audience, I know it's a little sad because this is our last Cafe Sci of 2020, but don't worry, we will be back next year with more amazing speakers and topics, and we look forward to hosting you guys again very soon. Um, if you are interested in other technology and uh, please feel free to check some of our events out on house.com. You can find all the information and registration info there. Um, and with that, I'll let you guys enjoy the rest of your Thursday night. And I look forward to seeing you guys all back in 2021.